let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Track. I'm so happy to have everybody here. Before we get started, because I know this is going to be a, a, a really popular talk, um, uh, Margaret and uh, Emily are outside. Emily is doing uh, free caricature, not free, but uh, paid caricatures that will raise money for the parade. Uh, so please come do that. We also have a donation box in the back for literacy, because if you can't read, you can't verify independent facts. So enough of that. Welcome to Snopes.com. Uh, my name is Dave Moss. I am a senior investigative researcher at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I am here to interview my great friend, Arturo Garcia, uh, from Snopes. You are all here because wow. last night you were at uh, Rooftop Karaoke and you heard him do Bust a Move, Young MC's Bust a Move, and then promote this panel. And so I want to thank you all for writing it down and coming down here for, for, for this event. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Snopes, it is what I think is the gold standard for fact checking on the internet. It's where I go and I find something in my social media feed and I'm like, hmm, this sounds a little too good to be true. And I'm going to start by, but I, I know that, that Arturo is the one who wrote it. And so, uh, I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions that I probably somewhat know the answer to already, and then we'll go and we'll get some audience questions. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, anyways, so let's start, Arturo. Uh, tell me how you got to where you are. Like, what's, what's the backstory? What's the origin story of the truth seeker, Arturo Garcia? Very ha happily. Um, I was one of those kids who grew up uh, liking to write, but never really having an outlet for it. And then I got into my uh, my student paper in high school, and that kind of set me on my way. I worked in student publications throughout my, uh, my college career, uh, graduated, and went up to uh, work for a print newspaper in Wichita Eagle. Anybody here from Kansas? Uh, Kansas. All right. <laughs> um, Later on, uh, I wrote for uh, the local NBC TV affiliate in San Diego, California. And uh, like a lot of folks, it would have been around 2008, you know, the job market wasn't very hot. Uh, and I kind of dropped out of the biz for a while. But again, like I think a lot of other folks, uh, the internet provided a pathway for me to not just get published, but connect with people who were having the kind of conversations and asking the kind of questions that I, I wanted to see reflected in, in, in media. And for me, that was a site called uh, racialicious.com, which explored popular culture from the lens of communities of color. Uh, and that adventure led me to write for uh, The Raw Story, uh, which that, I spent about four years there. And then in late 2016, uh, Snopes was going through a, a period where it was building up its, its news division to fight what was at time, what was, we were beginning to see the burgeoning expansion of what's popularly called fake news, also called junk news, but when it comes down to it, it's, it's the latest wave of, of propaganda and disinformation. And that's how we ended up here. Excellent, thank you. Um, so. Uh, it, from your perspective, why is this work important? What would happen if we didn't have people like you in the world? I'm going to object to the phrasing of, of people like me because only because only because um, fact fact checking used to be part and parcel with journalism 101, and I don't mean that as a knock. I mean that from experience because a lot of times what you'll see is. Uh, when the news websites, when news operations uh, scuttle their their editorial staff, scuttle their copy editing staff for, in the name of quote unquote generating profit, that that deteriorates uh, news as a, as a medium, as an industry. Um, what I like about my job is that I actually have the resources to spend days or even weeks on a story, contacting whoever I need to contact. Whereas for other outlets. You're asked to put out, you know, five stories per day. You know, like you were back in the Hearst era. And that kind of uh, news gathering, you lose, you lose stuff, you lose details. It's, it, that will happen. And uh, that damage can be um, exponentially increased through syndication, through aggregation. 
Uh, there's a story I want to get to that kind of exemplifies that. And so I, I think I think what I do is 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 back to basic stuff. And the, the reasons the reason why that's getting lost isn't so much the fault of the talent, it's the fault of the economic forces that come in and try to, you know, in their eyes, reverse engineer uh, a solution to a perceived problem. And in the process, they cause more damage. Uh, so, like, as you noted, fake news isn't necessarily a new thing. We were talking about disinformation that goes way back. But I feel like that term has, uh, you know, entered my consciousness during the, you know, late 2015, early 2016. How has things, have things changed since then? I mean, is it just me perceiving it, or... Or has things actually like it, it, explain to me how things have changed since 2016? I think the TLDR version of this is weaponization. You have more websites out there that are explicitly devoted to the purpose of of spreading spear. Uh, you know, and someone will do it under the form of satire. Uh, someone will do it just because they know there's an audience out there that will take it. And once you have, even even in the you know, not even two years I've been in film that I've noticed is that uh, the methods are expanding. It, it's not just blog posts anymore. Now it's just memes. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's stuff that gets uh, murkier and murkier and worse and worse. And I, I, I think that's an example of how people have, have missed you the technology of the internet to advance a very old form of, of social damage. Cool. Um, so, take me through your process a bit. How do things land on your desk, and then what do you do when you get them? We get a lot of stuff via reader submission. Um, if we will notice, you know, any given day we'll get uh, multiple people asking about a, about a story. Um, as many of you may know, we work with Facebook, and they also highlight, hey, there's a lot of searches for, for this story. That's how, you, that's how a lot of stuff gets done. And we're, we're free to enterprise stories on our own as well. But if you're asking where it gets started, a lot of time it's people, people are, are raising the flag for us, and we go from there. And then what do you do when you've decided that this is something that you're gonna, gonna research and, and do the fact check on? You look for the first source. You look for the first, either the first site that posted uh, if it's, a, it's done in a story format, you look for the page on Facebook that posted the image, if it's one of those, or in one case, you look for the Tumblr account that posted it. Uh, there was a story I did about, uh, one second, it was, it was, uh, the claim was that Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis disavowed the Confederacy, and that spread via Tumblr, and then what people did was they would screen cap it, and they would put, put it on Facebook, and it recirculated there. So you see two different platforms getting used. Um, and people weren't even doing this one maliciously. They were doing it in an attempt to, to show, you know, to uh, denounce neo-Confederates and such. But those claims were full of holes themselves. And in this case, we, you know, again, luckily enough with Snopes, you have a, enough of a name that people kind of want to talk to you for once. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes they do not. <laughs> and sometimes they just want to get a, get a, uh, get a hold of. Uh, for one story, I literally called or emailed 20 state housing related agencies and I caught a break just because I reached a professor at Indiana University who was into, into the subject. But it, it, that's the kind of, again, I have the time to do that. Whereas at other publications, I, I just wouldn't. And, and what, are, what are the, I mean, I see some fact check sites decide to do you know, various rankings of whether something's true or false. How do the, the delineations between the various types of false or unfounded work for you? Like, how do you determine when something is, is actually false and just unsubstantiated? Well, unsubstantiated is, is unproven. Um, and the proof kind of comes down to the pudding on, on that. Um, <laughs> I know that was true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, uh, is, it, is it disappointing when you find things that are true? No, there there are some surprises actually. There's there's a uh, well, what's something that you were sure was going to be fake and turned out to be true? Um, let's see. Ah, oh, here we go. In in June, the president made a speech uh, accusing Canadians of 
doctoring their shoes and smuggling them out of the U.S. What do you mean, doctoring their shoes? Uh, so, uh, there's a story of, of talking about people living in Canada, coming to the United States, and smuggling things back into Canada because the tariffs are so massive. The tariffs to get common items back into Canada are so high. Uh, <laughs> So high that they have to smuggle them in. They buy shoes and wear them. They stuff them up to make them sound old or look old. No, we're treated horribly. And well, now the first, you know, first case, uh, first glance, it seemed seem like, um, let's call it bombast. Uh, but come to find out, that was based not on a story, but on an op-ed. By the way, please, 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 learn to delineate between an op-ed, an editorial, and a and a story. That will make a lot of difference in their arguments online. Do you want to just quickly do the quick one, two, three? Just sure. An editorial is done by a newspaper or publications board. An op-ed is a single person or, you know, two, two byline, three byline column. Uh, and it will say opinion or perspective or what have you. In a news story, the radio roll byline, that's the front page stuff. Um, unless you're at a site that is devotedly about op-eds or hot takes or what have you. Well, it was based on a column in the New York Post. Uh, from a woman who actually, she didn't stuff the shoes, but she would pass off these shoes she would buy to, she would buy to her brother, who would go between Canada and the U.S., and yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, the shoemaking industry still knocked the president for it, but it, it, it wasn't completely out of thin air. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, to the dismay of children everywhere, Tell me about the time you debunked Santa. <laughs> the skeptics track. <laughs> now this ties now this ties back to the uh, aggregation issue I mentioned earlier. December 2016, East Tennessee, uh, the Knoxville News Sentinel publishes a column. A column talking about uh, a guy who worked as a department store Santa, or, you know, Santa in the community. And the story was that he received a call from a friend who worked at a local hospital. Um, a family uh, asked for him to go there because their, their five-year-old boy was dying, uh, and he wanted to see Santa. And the story goes that Santa went to the hospital, and made it way into the hospital, and as he was there with the child, the boy died. And again, this started as an op-ed. But because Knoxville is part of the Gannett chain of newspapers, USA Today picked it up and ran it as a story. And then it got picked up by CNN. Then it got picked up by the classy newspapers. And it's going all over the place. Now you're wondering, what kind of cringy bastard <laughs> looked at this story? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jay, um, uh, what kind of skeptic looks at this story and wants to poke a hole in it? And I'm thinking, what if, why is my kid with a stranger when he's having a medical, uh, a potentially, and in fact, fatal medical episode? What are the rules for this hospital? Are the rules of this hospital different than they would be for other hospitals? So I called the columnist who I'm not going to name. Uh, but he's one of those guys who's been there for like 20 years, a local institution. And he heard the story, um, he talked to the guy, but they couldn't confirm that it happened. I, I called literally every hospital in the Knoxville area, and either they, either they wouldn't talk to me, or they said that this, this didn't happen at their shop. Uh, so, a couple days after I started making these calls, the Sentinel published their own follow-up story. Uh, and I'll quote, The new Sentinel cannot establish that Sch Schmidt Maxson's account is inaccurate, but more importantly, ongoing reporting cannot establish that it is accurate. Therefore, because the story does not meet the newspaper standard of verification, we are no longer standing by the veracity of, of Santa's account. Mm -hmm. Aww. <laughs> well, next thing I know, CNN is calling me. 
why did you decide to ask about this? And I'm like, why didn't you decide to ask about this? <laughs> um, you know, and it, it, it's funny in a sad way, but again, it shows how, what was it, to, to you know, paraphrase Mark Twain, how much faster a lie can spread than the truth? Yeah. Again, because, uh, because someone didn't gather the facts from the outset and put it out there, in this world of, of, of media we're in, where so many entities are connected and can just syndicate content willy-nilly, nobody followed up on this until it was too late. You know, so we ended up being the final backstop. I, 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 I love stories like this. Uh, I, can I share one of my own real quick? Sure. Okay. So we were both in San Diego as uh, as reporters, and the local nonprofit news organization, Voice of San Diego, had its own fact checker, like fact checker, regular Politifax style thing. And uh, I worked at a competing newspaper and liked to troll Voice of San Diego. And one day I picked up a Chinese restaurant menu that said this was Robin Leach's favorite Chinese restaurant. Uh, Robin Leach, uh, formerly of life. Lifestyles uh, of Life, <laughs> of Lifestyles of Richard Famous. And I said, no way that the guy in the Lifestyles of Richard Famous likes this Chinese restaurant. And they went, and I had tweeted out, and I'm like, you have to do this one, you have to do this one. They, I wouldn't leave him alone. They did it, and they called him up. And he said, I have no recollection of this Chinese restaurant. And they didn't rank it false. They were like, unsustained, like, we don't know, maybe mostly true, because he said, it could have been my favorite. I was so upset about that. Or, I'm going to segue into a question here, rather than just, you know, talk about it. A comment and the question. Right. So, so, so you know, how, what, what difference, you know, what are the differences between how Snopes goes about fact-checking and other sites like PolitiFact go about fact checking. Is it similar, the same, or different? Or I try. I try not to read a lot of PolitiFact um, for, for the reason that when you're a writer, you don't read a lot of other writers in your genre. Uh -huh. um, it, to me, it feels like a, like a, like a, a door I don't want to open too much. Um, if anyone else has critiqued on PolitiFact, I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I, I, I can't feel that the, the process has to be that, uh, that different because at the end of the day, we're both into, we're both, uh, again, like journalists should be and can be, given the, uh, the appropriate resources, is about producing the primary source and as much documentation or expert, uh, expert input as you possibly can. Well, let's talk about like uh, you know what what are some of the high stakes? I'm just looking at your computer, so I'm trying to lead you up for it. Um, what are some of the high stakes uh, fact checks that you've done, like that have been really important? Or I can go the other direction. What been the dumbest one? What has been the weirdest, dumbest, lowest, like you know you know stakes fact check that you've done? I had to pay to watch Show Dogs. <laughs> uh, it's a movie. It's a, uh, this is one that became important and, uh, because the movie uh, was criticized by what's called mommy blogs. And the complaint was that a couple of scenes where uh, uh, glorifying uh, the, the grooming practice of child abuse because of, of the way that it showed the dogs being fondled at a competition, or handled. Um, I got my $10 back expensed. Um, <laughs> and it was, I mean, it was one of those things where I, I read the original review, and I quoted from it. Um, and then I, I, I watched it, and there was, there was stuff that was not mentioned in that review. And I guess one of those things where, where context is key, and you, wanna, you want to watch for that with the outlets you're consuming. And we can get to that in a bit as well. Um, I'm not going to recap this movie because I value all of our sanity. But the, the, the review didn't mention that everybody involved, uh, every character involved in that scene was not happy about having to partake in this, for one. And then I called. Uh, you know, the American Kennel Club, this, you know, the way it was depicted in the movie doesn't happen in, in actual competitions. But again, you know, the, the scenes ended up getting cut because there was, there was enough of a, uh, there was enough of a complaint raised by, from these mommy blogs that they felt that they took action. 
and that certainly wasn't the first instance of studios being uh, pressured by a reverse engineered uh, outrage spin. Just ask Marvel how that went. Um, are there serial offenders with disinformation or... <laughs> <laughs> Everyone laughs at that and get the joke. I'm just reading my questions here like that. It's a look at my Oh, yes, there are. Um, there's a lot of them, and we have a we have a guy on the site that says he lists a lot of the, a lot of uh, the recurring offenders of uh, people of sites that spread fake news. Um, I'll, I'll name one just because it, it was an especially egregious story. Uh, a site called Freedom Junction, J U N K S H U N dot com, uh, posted a story call, calling uh, Sergeant David Johnson, who was killed in Niger during assault. Should have been the first clue. <laughs> <laughs> you, you would think, right? Um, and this is one of those sites that has, it's a part of a, a network of sites that are owned by the same person. That um, their take is that they're satirizing conservative arguments because they're putting it so over the top that they can't possibly be believed. Oh yeah. Uh, well, they pulled, they pulled the story, right, after we started asking questions. And then they said um, that they were going to donate the money they made off of that to a charity. And my colleague, Bethania Palma, did this story. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll quote from that. They, they said they're going to, um, they said they were going to, let's see, like, they said they were going to donate the proceeds to a site. Um, that was for, uh, for military families. Uh, we contacted that site. They said they don't take donations. They lean to other charities. <coughs> they also said that Philly Junction hadn't contacted them. Oops. Yeah. So, uh, uh, let's see. It's like some meta, meta disinformation. <laughs> that's beyond doubling down. So Freedom Junction, uh, they're also part of the uh, uh, last line of defense. That's one of their affiliates. They're, and they, they do a lot on Facebook, too. And a lot of it's like, they had a story, Our, uh, California will now implement Arabic numbers. <laughs> <laughs> After that, you know, there's a, I don't want to name names, but then we're talking about sites that complain of globalists are putting chemicals in your diet coke and Taylor Swift promotes it. It's a real segment, by the way, I had to watch that. And they're filling us all like with NK Ultra 2, man, and I don't know, he might be Bill Hicks, but I'm not going to say one way or the other. <laughs> You're gonna make me cry. I'm sorry. It was like <laughs> Sunday. I'm a little emotional, and the humor is so funny. Um, uh, this just sort of came to me. So, so you know, I, I really hate when people use the term fake news because I feel like we've got two different definitions out in the world. It's just kind of too too confusing that people don't understand what you're talking about. What is the preferred term that you use for for you know garbage? I guess disinformation. Disinformation. I think when it comes down to that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. Um, I think. Uh, fake news kind of uh, soft pedals it, and if I'm if I'm catching what you mean, then other people just kind of cling to it as a way to say, well, I don't like how, I don't like that that's true, so I'm going to say it's fake. Yeah, you know? I mean, I've been called fake news. Have you been called fake news by? by, by some, by some, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm guessing yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, let's talk about some, some disinformation self-defense. What can people do, what are some tips that people can do to make sure they're not repeating garbage, not believing it? What can people do? First of all, if it's spelled J-U-N-K, it's not <laughs> like, Or like 9-11patriotinside.org. Uh, 9 9 um, it... If you come across a story, and, it's, and even if it's, let's say, a bit exaggerated, and I think, I think most of us have, have that sense pretty calibrated, like, you know, like, this, this, this kind of sounds off. Um, look it up. Well, when I was aggregating 
our standard was uh, two legitimate sources, and I'll go into legitimate in a second, you know, uh, two well-founded sources corroborating that story. I think that's a good building block. Um, if you want to talk about legitimate, you know, and I, I, I again, I don't want to condescend, but I, I have to tell you that I have gotten emails saying, um, this site, Washington Post, uh, said said that Trump said this, and I, I think regardless of how you feel about the post as an entity, I you know a lot of this. I'm not going to say all of itself, but the vast majority of itself is at least well founded and well constructed and sourced. And I think that issue goes back, you know, even to the, to, to an educational level. We don't our you know the kids younger than us. I think have a have a much more advanced sense of uh, media literacy and, and media integration in their lives than we did at that stage because they have so much more available to them. Um, at the same time, I still think we can do better uh, going over how to read a news story and what to look for. And I, I think those are at least I think those are the basic tools that we, we could all use. Um, all right, so we're going to start queuing up for questions, or you're going to start queuing up for questions. I'm going to stay here. <laughs> awesome. Uh, you, you know, I, we didn't talk about this in advance, so I, if you don't have a good answer for this, it's fine. It's my, it's my bad. But uh, do anonymous sources, you know, the use of anonymous sources in other news stories complicate the fact-checking process? If the claim is made to be fact by, you know, an insider or whatever agency, like, can you deal with that? Or? Yeah, and, and that's one of those that you have to go back to the outlet. Um, and for, uh, you know, every other story you see in there about, you know, the Clinton body bags. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, there was one I came across recently that said that, you know, preliminary sources from police told us that, no, I actually called the police and I talked to them and I quote, and I made, identified their, you know, the person I talked to. And they, they you know, debunked that and they denounced that. But uh, I think, again, it's, um, it's one thing for the Post or the New York Times to have an anonymous source. <clears throat> It's another when your site's uh, idea of a byline is a character from Fight Club. <laughs> and and you, you had also talked about earlier, and then we'll, we'll go to you, but um, uh, you talked about the you know how something from Tumblr you know, started the misinformation and then jumped over to Facebook. Are there particular social media you know, uh, or social networks that are more susceptible to this than others? I think we're at a point where we have to start wondering how, if they're actually just willing to go along at this point. Uh, it, it, Tumblr and Facebook, and this is just me on my own, I'm not, not going to purport to speak myself on this, but Tumblr and, and Facebook and Twitter um, have not shown a, a concrete effort besides even working with us to, to, to shut down these outlets or to de-platform these outlets that are spreading this willy-nilly. Um, and uh, as I, it, I wonder, I worry because we, we rely on them so much where that's going to take us. Um, we'll, we'll start the questions back. Great. Um, I've encountered some people in my life who've been skeptical of Snopes as an entity. So what would you say is the most concise way, uh, you know, if you ask someone who's doubting or thinks Snopes has its own agenda or is backed by, you know, certain forces, let's say. So what is the most concise way, would you say, to explain Snopes as an entity, someone who's maybe not familiar, and maybe uh, help them understand that it is a good quality work, basically? We show the work. Mm -hmm. Go to any story on our website, you'll see a source listing. Yeah. You know? And a lot, you know, those sources will be published, they will be, you know, they will, they will be uh, listed, they'll be interviewed. Like, a, you know, I debunked the Breitbart story. I took the white part story. Uh, they were they were accusing um, uh, Middle Eastern immigrants of, of, of spreading disease out of, out of this town, you know, in our in our town, because and their their proof of this was a Starbucks is having a hiring fair. <laughs> what? Uh, B they they got a hold of a study published at UC San Diego, and posted what they said the data showed. Well, I actually talked to the scientist who published that study, 
hey, you know, I, I, I showed him what Bright Bar did. He's like, no, that's not what that is at all. And I mean, we laid out, I mean, it's exactly the method in which they distorted the funding. So if they got a problem with me, fine. If they got a problem with the site, fine. But ask them if they looked at the source listings on our stories. And if they say they don't care, that, that tells you more than you need to know. Thank you. So you, you had mentioned that a lot of this information is coming from rogue websites or memes or even things that are claiming to be satire. In journalism, there's an ethics code that they all kind of theoretically work under. What can be done to kind of expand that ethics code or get other avenues of this disinformation to be a little more scrupulous? Because we're not covered by a union, right? Uh, organizations have individual unions, but there's not like uh, IOXI for journalists, for that way. That can be tough. Um, my hope is that uh, groups like SPJ, the Society of Professional Journalists, uh, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, of Black Journalists, the Asian uh, American Journal Association, my hope is that those groups become more vocal uh, on behalf of the profession in denouncing these types of, these types of, of, of actors. Um, there's, you know, there's no unified meaning, you know, can't we all, we don't, the, but the, the rogue, the people who publish this kind of stuff aren't going to go to professional seminars and, and conferences because they know they get laughed out of the room at best. Um, so it, it's a tough road to hoe and I feel, I feel like us as journalists, the, the more the more vocal we become about that, and on top of the better we do at our own work, I think that's. I think right now that's that's our path forward. Uh, hey, so I know you mentioned that you don't read Politifact and or don't like tend to. Well, certainly read. not when, I, when I'm working on something. Yeah, but, yeah. But uh, just my question in general comes with like certain sites like Politifact or that rank claims as like true, mostly true, like extremely false, pants on fire, Pants stuff on like fire. that. Do you think that those ranking systems can in and of itself be a form of disinformation? Because in a way, anyone who's writing that is basing that on their own opinion, on their own filters, as opposed to just saying, hey, these are the things that are untrue, these are the things that are unfalse, but like, as opposed to judging the entire claim, if that makes sense. You know, in, in theory, the risk is there, but again, it comes down to what's on the page. Um, if PolitiFact says something's pants on fire but doesn't have the sourcing for it, then yeah, there's an issue. But um, when I come across their work, in general, I find that they do source stuff. I haven't, I haven't spotted, uh, I haven't spotted on, on, on something on PolitiFact that I think is just outrageously out of, out of, out of context. So. Um, I, again, you know, looking at a story by story, I, I think you have to look at again. We we list our sources. I think the list does as well. Yeah. So go, you know, go through that, and if you find if if you find this, that they either completely blew the read on that, mm -hmm. um, then maybe. But if, and I'm not saying um, yes. Uh, are there filters? Are there? Is it come down to you know to interpretation? Yeah, but. Is it, is it, does the reading back it up should be the key question. Okay. I, I, I mean, from my perspective, I, I, I do, I have mixed feelings about things like the Pants on Fire or Pinocchio or things like that because it, feel like, it feels sometimes like it's going beyond saying something's true or false and into some sort of objective stuff. Although, for me, I mean, I want to, I do want to know if the person being fact-checked is going to double down on the lie or is going to say, you did a great job, you've corrected me, I'm going to correct it. <coughs> then those are two sort of different tiers of how to, how to, how to look at somebody <laughs> during a fact check. I mean, I definitely think it's worse if somebody doubles down on why. Right. You know. Hey, could you impact it a little more? So, so when I see like a pants on fire, like somebody being wrong, like some people, people are wrong in the world. Like I've been made mistakes, people make mistakes, and it's often a matter of how you handle the mistake. Like whether you were transparent about why you made the mistake or you correct the mistake, 
And I feel like there's a certain like nobility, and that's how you continue to build trust by showing that you are oh, okay. fallible um, versus somebody who double down, doubles down. Now, but with, when you have something like pants on fire, it, sometimes when I see somebody I don't like get a pants on fire, I'm like, yes, which is a little bit more than they were false. You know, you know what I mean? Maybe I'm not attacking it very well. No, I, I, I think that. Uh, I, I can't knock it because I think that's that's, that's an in-house choice. Um, whatever they will be, you know, we don't do hella false. We we just do false. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm saying that's one of the things I really do appreciate about Smokes is that it, it's false. You know, it's not false and this guy's a jerk. You know, right? <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, it's false and it's not saying false. This person is a dirty, filthy liar. That's just false. And I think I think that is one of the things that I respect about Snopes and makes me feel like Snopes is very, very uh, reliable. Now. Just a compliment. You, you said that uh, you think that the students and the young people are more able to consume news uh, and separate fact from fiction. The, the studies that I've seen suggest that they can't actually do that, and they have problems separating sponsored content from actual facts that there's a, a value of the narrative or uh, over truth. So what, what are some of the things that we need to do to become more intelligent consumers of things that we see online and in print? I feel like everybody in a newsroom has asked themselves this at some point or other. Um, I think it, it can, not to oversimplify, but it starts with good old fashioned critical thinking. Um, and, and double check on your record. Again, and, and I hate to keep hanging this, but again, we, we, uh, we list our sources. I'm, I'm pretty sure PolitiFact does as well. Um, most of the time when you read a publication and they, and they sort something, they'll link to it. And you can track that. Um, you know, look up uh, the International Fact Checking Network. I think they have a list of accredited websites and, 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 as well. That's a real thing? Yeah, cool. What is it again? International Fact Checking. Yep, let me look that up right now. I love the inclusion of sources. It's like, it, it, you know, to me, I'm just sort of filling time here. Like, no, I got it. No, no <laughs> it's, it's a real thing. It's the Pointer Institute. You know, and uh, and I, I I think and, and you know Google uh, Google have this thing that where if you if they will highlight if something seems iffy, um, but I, I, I think do do in depth reading, do do follow up on your own. I, I think I've, I've come across stories that that get spread just because people don't read past the headline, and that's not a not necessarily. That's what these that's what these outlets are counting on you to do to get that visceral reaction from the headline and pass it along based on that. You know, nowadays we call it clickbait, but he headlines are always designed to entice the reader. This is just a, a, a more weaponized form of doing that. Um, you know, keep, keep reading, keep asking questions. That's, you know, that's where it starts. Oh, uh, point taken on the, on the study by Youth and Media, by the way. Thank you for that. My question actually ties in very well with the last gentleman. I'm a middle school teacher. Okay. Uh, and I find that 12 year olds are surprisingly inept at operating <laughs> the internet. There was a, apparently a transition from the time that they were using computers to using their phones. And the, the, they got lost in the mix? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, based on them, I'm trying to see what suggestions you have for teaching middle school age kids how to fact check, how to be good consumers. Of news. I mean, I'd like to just say, well, here's a list of reliable places to get your information from, and here's a list of unreliable uh, sources. You know, Washington Post would be over here, and obviously you know, Fox News over here, but, you know, um, <laughs> short of just telling them this good, this bad, right. what, are, what are some good strategies that, uh, that we can use to teach the younger generation? Have you done it together? Like, have you gone through and plumbed the story together? I mean that could be fun. Um, do it, you know? Do a review for a day. Take a story. Look up. Look up the source document. Uh, dig into that. Um, Should that be one that they, that you know is false to begin with, so the kids can have the pleasure of, of finding that out? 
I'm tempted to say Santa, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can't tell the difference between fact and opinion a lot of times in this yeah. day and age. Mm -hmm. The lesson would be to do a a hard source fact and opinion and a fake and compare and contrast the three. Yep. Like, you know, I, I mean, when we're, when we're teaching things at EFF and not necessarily on this issue, you like to think about, like, okay, there's this huge thing we want to teach, but, like, what is the one takeaway that we can get people? So, like, we're teaching people how to make, like, really strong passwords using a complicated system at our table that involves dice. But if people walk away just knowing not to use the same password over and over again, I feel great. And so I think for me, if I was one thing that would be really easy to teach people, it would be just don't use Wikipedia, but use the Wikipedia sources at the bottom. Like, simple tip that I find is particularly useful to people. Maybe I'm totally wrong. No, I think, you know, I, I think he's laid the front on a good point. I, I think there's, uh, I would suggest doing a, de a group, a, a, a debunking project together. Um, that way it becomes, that way they know, they can participate in the process with you and you can kind of lead them along. And that way tools get, it's not just this good, this bad, it's that they can, they can see why it's bad. Where and where the other, where they, where it went wrong, or where it started uh, muddying up the water, and they can learn to find sources on their own. It's you know, it's another form of research in the end. Awesome. Thank you. Hello. 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 Um, you keep mentioning that you cite your sources, and I think. It could be easy to falsify sources, and um, sorry, more so. I guess I wonder: is there anything preventing Snopes from falling into the wrong hands? <laughs> how how can we continue to trust Snopes? Cite the sources. If they sold out or something, how would we know? The ultimate skeptic. You'll pack that just a bit more. Okay. I offer you 50 gazillion dollars to sell me Snopes and continue to report things as true and false, but I have an agenda. How do we know that Snopes will not take that deal? What happens when the current owner dies? Huh? What happens when the current owner dies? Um, then you go into Thunderdome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel, like, I feel like this would be a difficult question to answer, just because. Do we, you know, well, I think that. Well, I, 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 I think one of the advantages. I think one of the advantages we have is that we're not. Uh, we're not part of, of of like a chain. You know, we're not. We're not living and dying like, as as we speak on the whims of whatever. Uh, whatever the next quarterly report says. Um, you know, are, are, are we in danger? Possibly, but everybody's in danger. Look around the industry. Look at the look at the Denver Post. They were, you know, they had new ownership cut in and like a year later they were gutted. Look at LA Weekly. Um, but, and, and those are venture, I mean, those are venture capitalists. Um, I don't think David Nicholson is a venture capitalist. Um, I, 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 you know, Stay tuned. I, 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 would, I would also say that if somebody terrible came in and bought Snopes, I, I have a feeling Arturo would not stay on board and if he was told not to do what he does and what he's passionate about. And Say hello to Ace reporter Tyler Gurdon. <laughs> um, but, but that's the other thing is that I think is, and I think that if you can't necessarily rely on the institutions themselves, you can often rely on the reporters. And there's a lot of turnover in the industry where a good reporter will move to one publication to another public to another publication. I think that it's I find it's useful to not just get to know the publication, but to actually mark when you read a good story and you're like, that is a solid reporting, be like, that is a name I want to see. When that person leaves Politico to go to um, the Washington Post or they go to the Intercept or they go to the Guardian, like mark that, like, that's somebody to keep following as they move along in their career. I mean, certainly like Arturo, this is not his only job he's ever had in his life. He was great at Raw Story and he's great at Snopes now. But you should still verify. You verify the sources to see if that's still true. Their sources start changing. Yeah, it's a clue that there's been a change in the head. 
So if, 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 if Sarah Huckabee Sanders is returning my calls, <laughs> I'll put up a little smoke signal. So <laughs> for, the, for the folks in the back who couldn't hear up here, um, it was reiterated that one of the telltale signs of that sort of thing is if Snopes was to start changing its sources, start relying on less reliable sources or not, publish it as sources. That might be some sort of uh, canary. Great. So, hi. Um, I do have kids, certainly right now from PM20. Oh, can you just call, like, a little closer to the mic? All right. Closer. Yeah. Closer. Okay, so I have two kids, 17 and 20, so they're older now. My 17-year-old is a flat-out skeptic, all right? Yeah. And crazy. And so she has people are like, since she is so logical, if you're not, again, you're your forum. So she runs into that a lot. And so how I told my kids is that um, if you're reading a special interest piece or an opinion piece, you should feel emotional. If you're reading a news story, you should not. Good way and that running. appeal to the emotion argument is what I've always been too sensitive to. And is that a good way to figure out what's coming out as false or an opinion? Or not necessarily? Like a starting place. I mean, I, I, I want to say that there are horrible things that happen in the world that are covered by people. And so sometimes when journalism under, overturns atrocities... If it's a tragedy yeah. or something. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, even... Even beyond tragedy, it's, it's um, and I think if, if, if it's a case of, let's say, uh, like, remember City Hall back, back all of the years ago, with those council members who were on the ticket lobbyists and, and all that, mm -hmm. and the UT, and our local people want to publish it for reporting on that. It's hard not to read this stuff and feel, and, and feel anger, feel sad that it's happening in your local community. You know? Did you cut any stuff? Or? No, this is a international city. Uh, oh, right, right. But, you know, the, the, the strip club lobbyists and all that. It's a long story about the family. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> ten, after ten. But it is, I, 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 I get where you're going, but I, I can't get behind, you know, you can't, feel, not feeling emotion behind the news story. Um, look at how it's presented. Look at the, look at the, uh, look at the way the, uh, the story's constructed. If you find it's going for like super over the top language, and again, it's another telltale sign of, of, right. of dubious websites. Um, like the use of adjectives, if the adjectives are getting like exclamation too wild instead of descriptive, does that make sense? Right. And, okay. Or when you know when it's uh, <laughs> gratuitous or salacious or uh, and, and again, there's stories that are really, uh, of stuff that is really bad that that a journalist can delve into responsibly, and I think the good reporting will always do that. And if you feel an emotion out of that, I think that's the sign of good reporting, not fake reporting. So responsibly. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Nice club. Oh, you see seen there earlier working comments? <laughs> <laughs> question for Arturo is, do you think that the mass media has kind of fallen down on its um, uh, standard of truth for its reporting? I mean, not so much that they are telling lies, but that they're not calling out things that are you know, untrue or questionable on that? I think what's happening is you're seeing a lot of journalists get, uh, get their legs cut off. Uh, and again, I'll reiterate these examples I mentioned earlier. The Denver Post got to get, taken over by new ownership and, you know, began laying off staff all over the place. Um, LA Weekly, one of the great weekly uh, alternative uh, news publications in Los Angeles got taken over by, by the ownership. And that was a case where um, a, a, uh, a venture capitalist cabal came in, completely torched the staff, and started publishing positive reviews of, of businesses that had business links to it. Oh, they, had, they, put, they, put, they put one of the board members on the cover promoting him as like this, you know, hip hop right. know, savior without even disclosing that he had a relationship with the paper. And mm -hmm. I I think that's a media problem because uh, that's a problem that's been foisted upon it. Um, and like I said with the uh, with with this you know the aggregation stuff and, and the outlets that expect you to put up like five, six stories a day you know, it's like a train engine. You've got to keep, you know, got to keep chugging the coal in to keep the train moving. But because that happens, the the, the the reporter working on that does not have the time to dig as deeply as they might want to, or might even be able to. Um, well, I'm 
I'm not thinking so much, you know, some of the finer points of it, but I'm kind of thinking back to the um, uh, few of the news, it was, I don't know, what was it, the Bowling Green Massacre. Uh, it's, oh, yeah. Yeah, something that was very straightforward, easy to say, that never happened. Mm -hmm. There was nothing, you know, nothing in the news at all about any, you know, mass shooting in Bowling Green by an immigrant or whatever, you know, as opposed to, I can see certain, you know, topics where it's like, it's, Obscure or questionable. But, oh, you know. no, we said it was false. No, no. Well, I'm sure you guys did. But I think the mass media, you know. like fact checking himself all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, the, the newscasters and the, you know, people on the radio. Depending on which element we're talking about, I guess, I guess these people kind of like uh, dancing to that conclusion to guarantee viewership. Because again, they need people to tune in, especially when ad rates are falling all over the place. Um, are they are they falling down on the, on on? Are they falling down on the job? I think they've been pushed into uncomfortable ways of pursuing it. Um, and, and again, if, if it's if it's an industry that depends on views, a lot of us are going to do whatever they have to do to get those views. Hi, um, it seems to me that a lot of news outlets uh, publish this stuff because people believe it. And I have a lot of very well intentioned uh, family and uh, friends of family and that kind of thing that seem to believe a lot of articles that they read that they don't hold up to even five minutes worth of Googling. Um, but what's the best way to help those people to understand the risks of lying on the internet? without coming across as kind of being a douchebag to the people that you really care about. <laughs> Are you near a bar? <laughs> um, from engaging a lot of these discussions with people, particularly around the time of the Ferguson uprising, um, I hate to tell you, but I don't think there's a way to avoid coming off like, like, you know, like a jerk. <laughs> uh, I think you have to kind of, uh, first off, like, take care of yourself and ask yourself how far you're willing to go uh, with these folks. And, and, you know, I hate to be pessimistic, but, uh, you know, I, 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 there are so many folks that just aren't going to come around uh, through prodding. Uh, I don't know what it's going to take yet, but my hope is that um, after, let's say, let's call it the fever of the times recedes a little, they can start making their way back. Um, you know, do what you can. Um, don't, don't let yourself get lost in that. And, you know, we'll, we'll hope for the best. And, uh, I, I mean, if I can add, like, I think that it's also important that, that to point out that these, this information has consequences on real people. Like, people's no. lives are actually yeah. affected by it, right? Oh, yeah, relationship, yeah. Uh, you know, these corrode relationships. Yeah. But, but I mean, but I mean a, 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 you know, a viral story that is about a person that is false can actually have a damage on the person who's the subject of it. And I think that, you know, I, one, one thing we've witnessed in our work is that people aren't necessarily always connecting real people to the things that they're doing on the internet. And that if people are able to make that connection, maybe they are more empathetic and they realize that there are consequences. It's not just you put trolling out or bullying into the, into the net and you, just because you don't see it having an impact on people that it's not actually there. Man, next thing you know, someone's taking a gun to a pizza parlor because they heard something on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. I think, if, I mean, if you can, like Dave said, I think it's a good idea. Highlight, highlight that people are getting hurt over this now. Humanizing. Thank you. Thank you. We have about five minutes left, but I think, how far is the line back? Three or four people? Four people? Yeah. So let's, speak right. let's try to do it. Well, good news. I have quick questions. Um, so, disclaimer, I came in late, so if I'm asking a question that someone's already asked, forgive me, um, and my ignorance. Um, but I did some research long ago because I, I became intrigued on the, on the topic of fact-checking and stuff like that. And I was wondering, you know, is it a law for news organizations to fact-check? Is it, like, 
I was wondering, is it law, like, you know, a law for them to do that? No, right? Because it infringes on their freedom of speech, right? Um, on their rights of freedom. So that was question number one. Thank you for answering that. Simple. Okay. <laughs> Second question, um, can you give me some, like, two or three organizations that are dedicated to fact-checking, like the International Fact-Checking Organization? Any other ones out there that are really, really good? Us knows. <laughs> oh, that was an easy one. You were late to the band. So, so <laughs> you know, I, I have to other than self-promotion. You know, I, uh, a whole level work. Uh, uh, again, I've got, I've, you know, I get to hear any anything stick against Politifact. I mean, I get the on, I get the criticism of Pants on Fire, but I don't think I've ever a reputable sources say that Politifact isn't legit. Um, I would look up the Pointer Institute in general um, because they have they can link. They have links to uh, fact-checking groups not just in the states but around the world, and they can they can refer you to like if a story in Brazil looks flesh fishy, you can look up Brazilian fact-checking institutions, and they they uh, I definitely the story myself. Okay. Um, I, I this isn't quite the same thing, but I think um, uh, on the media the the radio show puts out these really nice um, guides to uh, information after a like a a major like event like a terrorist attack or a shooting and like. You know how to filter your facts at during a, in, uh, an unreliable time where misinformation might be spread, and then they've got like one for like you know after a shooting, after an earthquake, you know that kind of thing. And I think those are those are I find those helpful. What was that? Cool. Uh, on the media, it's uh, out of like the WNYC. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. You guys are doing very well. Thanks. Hello. Thank you. Lou. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. <laughs> Um, I was wondering your thoughts on how can we change the current trend for objective truth, science, and these, these legitimate news sources that you talked about being seen as liberal bias, and how can we get people out of their echo chambers when it comes to the information they're getting about the world? Because right now people are often loyal only to you know, their political party's sort of news sources and are kind of unwilling to look past that you know, and, and other sources. And they're, they're getting widely different information about even just what's going on in the world. Um, so wondering your thoughts on sort of how can we depoliticize truth? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, I think... It's on the air, it says truth is in truth. Right. Um, how about you write a book? Um, like you were saying earlier with the, with the other gentleman, I, I think if you can show the the real world effects of of being in that echo chamber, uh, or how this is affecting people out there in the world, you know, um, somebody got run over in Virginia because a bunch of a bunch of fools, people, a bunch of people live too long in a particular particular sphere and refuse to come out of it. Um, in keep pushing. I mean, there's, there's, if there was a simple fix, somebody would have found that already, but there's not. So, I can give you the short, short version. All right, one minute, 40 seconds. <laughs> we, we can do it, we can do it. To your thinking, is there merit uh, to drawing a distinction between news items that are untrue but misguided. I think of the story from a couple of years ago about Ann Coulter refusing to fly on a plane that was piloted by a black woman. Of course, that story was untrue, but it was a satire site, versus stories that are malicious in their falsity. Satire is great. Yeah. Is there, is there a, a, a litmus test for that or a merit to even drawing that distinction to your thinking? You know, this will be open to interpretation for, for, for a lot of folks, but I, I look at sites like Reductress, or, you know, the old classic The Onion, or The Hard Time, if you're into music. That's satire. It's not, it's, it's not demonizing uh, people or, 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 or peddling a stereotype for the sake of inflaming your readership. Um, you know, again, like calling a, a black swordsman a, a, a deserter, or, you know, hinging a story on the use of Arabic. Numerals. <laughs> um, you, know, I, I, you know, satire is funny when it comes down to it, uh, and a lot of and uh, these these other sites, besides just smearing people wholesale, they're just not funny. Thank you. 
Um, so I think we're out of time. Do we have room for one more? Can take the last question? Well, one more question. Just make it quick. Well, like, Where's that voice coming from? <laughs> 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 I'm good. I'm real good. <laughs> Comment on one of the previous questions about how to connect with somebody who uh, doesn't see the world your way. Listen to them. Have them explain to you why their opinion is right, why something that you see that is obviously false to you is apparently true to them. You might find out something you didn't know, but they might prove themselves wrong in the process. You might not need to do any more. That's a really good point. That's a really good I mean, point. I think that having conversations, like maybe people are more willing to listen if they feel like they're heard, you know, and maybe you don't have to believe them, but get them in engaging in a conversation. You're more if, confrontational on these sort of things. So. If, if, that <laughs> if that conversation is about somebody doing harm to my communities or, or, or other communities, I'm, you know, I, I think they can get a little dicey. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Okay, I think we're out of time. Arturo came here all the way from California. It's got to take place.